So multiply by denominator. Yes, it should. So there's only one good x value here, which is zero, because that will make a whole lot of these terms, two of the three terms disappear. So we're going to take advantage of that. If I don't, I'll have five unknowns in a linear system. It'll most likely be five or six equations with five unknowns. For sure, there'll be five unknowns. There'll be at least five equations. Um, let's change it to only have four unknowns, so log in x equals zero. So we get a equals one. And now we can plug that value back in where we see a, rewrite it with one less variable. And I'm going to start distributing some of these others so it's a little less work later. We have x cubed plus x. dx squared plus ex. And now I'm going to subtract. Actually, we'll, let's square this out first, then we'll subtract it. So we have x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. And I foiled, it, foiled that out super fast. I, just did the really quick uh, foiling right there. A little more careful on this next one. bx to the fourth plus cx cubed. Try to foil with decreasing powers of x. So if you look, I went first, and then I went inside, just because that gave me my next highest power of x. So you've should have foiled enough in your life that you can go any of the orders that you want to. So I'm just trying to line up in powers of x so my next step collecting uh, x powers of x will be a little bit easier. So now we have bx squared plus cx plus dx squared plus ex and now subtract everything with uh, no letters in front to the left. So that's all of this first three terms we're going to subtract. So the ones will cancel. We have negative x to the fourth. Now there's no x cubes, so I'm going to write that explicitly, zero x cubes, plus, or this will be minus two x squared. And the minus one cancels the one. And we have no x's, so we got 0x plus 0. It might seem a little silly to write all these zeros, but I'm just filling in the gaps. If we don't, but we still get it right, I'm going to place it in midterm. As long as you're on the next step when I match coefficients, I have to, you'll see on the next step where the zeros will show up. And then the right side, we're going to collect similar terms. So this is bx to the fourth plus and you don't have to parenthesize the single, uh, these single ones. Now we do have two x squared coefficients. We have b plus dx squared, c plus ex. And there is no constant term. Okay. I could write plus zero x, or just plus zero. There's no, that would be the constant term. All right, so there's going to be five equations we get out of here. So any algebra questions before I write out the five relationships between coefficients? So we're doing what's called matching coefficients now. So in front of x to the fourth is really a negative one. So we have negative 1 equals b. That's a really nice equation. 
zero equals C. That's really nice too. Negative two equals B plus D. And zero equals C plus E. The last equation is silly to write down. Zero equals zero. So that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't contribute at all. But if I got zero equals one, I went wrong somewhere. So I like to just write out every power. It's uh, sort of a little safety check, basically. Now the question was, did I have to write out 0x cubed? No, I didn't have to write out 0x cubed, but I did need to figure out that c was 0. So this line is necessary. And as long as you know that there's a 0 in front of the x cubed term, you don't necessarily need to write it. But if I don't write it, and I just have this, that's not very useful. So c needs to equal something, and in this case, it's what wasn't there, which is 0. So that's why I recommend that you don't uh, skip any terms, even if they don't appear. So actually write out how many x cubes you have, even if there are 0. So this is a trivial linear system, because I already know b. I already know c. That's going to give me d and e without using any real serious uh, linear algebra here. So e equals negative 1 and e equals 0. It looks like it. Yeah. So you just plug in. You're just doing substitution, but you don't even, you can probably do this in your head. Just use negative 1 there, and c is 0. So 0 is going to fill in for that c, and that gives you the other two letters. So we know all of these, and we're going to go ahead and rewrite somewhere up here, way up here. So A was 1, B, X plus C. So we have negative X plus 0. You don't need to write the plus 0, but I'm going to write it out just so we see where everything goes plus last up dx plus e d is negative 1 e is 0 so that is our new form of this original fraction here. So we have 1 over x plus negative x over x squared plus 1 plus negative x over x squared plus 1 <coughs> squared dx. So that was a large majority of the actual work to integrate this. So we've expanded this out. The first one is super easy, 1 over x. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x? Negative. It's not negative. It's a special power. That's a natural log. That's the one power that, if you tried the power rule, you'd be dividing by 0. All right, next one up. How do I integrate this next term? What's a good u sub? x squared plus 1, and du 2x, which we don't have a 2x, so 2x dx, so this will be 1 half du equals dx, and that will integrate the second one. What about the third one? Oh, yeah. My 2 just, or my x just disappeared. All right, what about the third one, the last one here? U sub, what's good U sub? X squared plus one. So luckily it works twice. That was just, we just got lucky on that one. Uh, of course this, this middle one will be ln of that stuff because it will look like one over U basically. The last one's gonna look like one over U squared, not the natural log, you go the anti-power rule on that one. So 
I'm going to write dot, 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 which means I expect you to be able to integrate this, although I'm not going to because this is more of a, uh, a problem from the last chapter as opposed to this chapter. I don't need to do any fancy integration by parts or, or not integration by parts, trig sub, any of that stuff. I don't need to do, get that fancy here. So that is the end of 8.4. So pretty much the moral of the story is do a lot of algebra. Do it carefully because your first step is super important. If you don't have the right form, for example, if I just forgot about that uh, x term right there, I would get no solution. Because there's no way to break it up in three fractions of this form. We saw that that was negative x is what that turned into. So if you only allow for a constant, you'll get no solution. And if you get no solution, that means generally you either made a mistake in your algebra or you start out with an impossible situation. There's no way to write our original fraction in the form that I have on the board. If you try, you'll get no solution. The breakdown is unique. There's not another way to break it down if you lay, uh, line it up like this. So we're into the next chapter. And we're actually going back to six, the one that we skipped. And the first one is 6.1, volumes using cross sections. First way we're going to find volumes using cross sections, we're going to slice by parallel planes. So draw your best sideways ice cream cone. And there's our axis right there. So we're going to go from x value A to x value B. And instead of finding area, we're now going to find volume. So one way to think about this, just think about taking a carrot and slicing it up into whatever these shapes are called. I think they call them medallions, but it seems like a far more grand term than what they are. Uh, slices. Is that x of k? That's x with a uh, k subscript. Uh, so think about taking a carrot, slicing it up. So every time you slice, that's a parallel plane that you're cutting through. So I want to pay attention to just these two cuts right here. So the first one is going to look like that. The second cut is going to look like that. So we're going to cut it right there. And let's look just at the section that we just cut. So I'm going to draw that a little bit bigger. So we'll get the region between xk and xk plus 1. <coughs> now this particular shape 
If I actually wanted to find the specific area of this shape, it would look a lot like a cylinder. Uh, but what I want to do is think about how does this area, if you knew this area right here, and you kept slicing this up, and you knew all the areas of the pieces you cut, how would you get the area of the entire shape? So if we cut it up in a whole lot of pieces, let's say 20 pieces, and you knew the area of each piece, how do you get the... Yeah, you just add them up. That's all you have to do. And that's all we're going to do here. So I need to find the volume. And this is going to be a function of x, because depending on what x is, I get a different volume um, as I go. Well. Let's hold off on that for a, a minute. How do I get the actual volume of a cylinder? So we have base. Um, when you say base, what type of measurement are we going to take on the base? We're going to take the area of a base and multiply it by the height. Or in this case, it's sort of sideways, so it's the area of that base times the thickness, or the width. Uh, for a cylinder, it will be a area of base times, I'm going to write width, because our cylinder is sideways. Now, what really changes, if I'm a really good chef, I could cut every single piece the same width. So what's really changing between each little piece of carrot that I cut? If I'm a really good chef and I can cut perfect width, yeah, the area of the base is going to change. It's going to start out small, actually zero, and then go up to whatever the other end is. Could we describe it as r? The radius is changing. You could, yeah, uh, but I want to think about the area. Uh, so it's area of a base, which changes with x. So it's a function of x, and multiply by the width, which I'm going to call delta x. That's how much x is changing each time I move over. So area base times the width, where delta x is this measurement right here. It's how wide the pieces are. And if I'm a professional, I can cut each piece exactly the same width. So that's our area of this piece. Actually, I should write x to the k, or x of k. For this particular piece, the area is at xk. Or you can use xk plus 1. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're going to cut it into an infinite number of pieces. So xk and xk plus 1 are going to be um, arbitrarily close together. So it doesn't matter which of the two you end up uh, going with. If you're only cutting in 20 pieces, it would be different. But if you cut it into infinite pieces, it won't matter. So we add up our total volume. You add up area xk and delta x. k equals on ours, k equals 0. Or we'll, yeah, k equals 0. Now, technically, there's n pieces. So if you start at 0, you don't want to stop at n. That would give you one too many pieces. So if you start at 0, you go to n minus 1. And this is an estimation not the exact. So we'll use squiggle equals for the approximation. Now to get the actual volume, all we need to do is cut infinitely small pieces. So we're going to take our width and make it infinitely small. So we do that. Lim
Of course, delta x does depend on n. So technically, delta x will get very, very small as uh, this n goes to infinity. And the details on that, delta x is b minus a over n. That's how you could figure out delta x. So how does that relate? b minus a, this total width is b minus a. Take the big value b minus the little value a. So that'll be b minus a, and then cut into n pieces. And that will be your width of each piece. Yeah, so as we send n to infinity, we're cutting that whatever, let's just say, um, I don't know, it was whatever, one wide before you cut it in 20 pieces, so it's 1 20th. Like 30 pieces, 1 30th, yeah. So as soon as you cut it into an infinite number of pieces, the width is infinitely small. All right, and this is, in calculus, the integral from a to b ax, and the delta x becomes dx. So this is the antiderivative, or the integral of the area function times dx from a to b. This looks a whole lot like the area under a curve. The only difference is if you think about the area under a curve, the function you integrated represented a height or a linear measurement. It didn't represent an area or a two-dimensional measurement. So we took a one-dimensional measurement and basically gave it some width. So we added a dimension. Here we're taking a two-dimensional measurement, uh, and they look like these little slices that we cut, and then we're adding a width to them, so giving them a three-dimensionality. So it's going to turn an area into a volume. So you're picking up another dimension. And this is going to be very useful. The difficulty comes in figuring out what is the area of a cross-section. It's easy on the one I showed you. It's basically just figure out the area of uh, the little circle that you're going to cut right there. So something like uh, pi r squared, except you have to be careful about your r. So here's our procedure. We're going to sketch the solid region. Sometimes easier said than done. And a cross section. So find a formula for the area of the cross section. Now, a lot of times it's going to be AX. That's assuming you're going down the x-axis. If you're going up the y-axis, it could be AY. And if you're going on the z-axis, it could be AZ. So it depends on what axis you're going to go down. Also, you need to find limits of integration. And then finally, integrate. And if it's an x, it'll look like ax dx is your volume. But the difficulty comes in finding a, b, and then finding the a of x. So you need to know your small and big x values, and also your area. So we'll start with an example. We'll do two examples.
So we have a square pyramid, pyramid with three, it's three meters tall with base three meters. Find the volume. So we could draw a picture, square base, and a height of three. That's not the best pyramid. All right, that's better. So we have a height measurement, which is going to be measured directly perpendicular to the base. And then our height, which is a little hard to label, so I'll label it out here, is also three. Random trivia, anybody know the area of the pyramid? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right, one-third base time site. So hopefully we'll come up with that using calculus as well. All right, I'm going to do something strange. I'm going to flip this upside down. So we'll redraw it. Here's the y-axis. I'm going to put the point of the pyramid, so we're flipping it upside down. So that'll be the top of the pyramid. And that'll make the base appear like this. So the pyramid will look like that. Let's think about cross sections. How should we cut this pyramid up so the cross sections are not horrible? Let's think about ways to slice this up. What happens if I cut this way? So if my cuts look like that, what will my cross sections look like? Triangle. Trapezoids? I think they will be trapezoids. They won't quite be rectangles. So if I cut it like this, I'll get trapezoids. Now, if I cut at a diagonal, I actually could get triangles. So if I actually cut like this over here, I could get triangles, which may not be a bad way to cut it up. But there's a really nice way to cut up a pyramid so that your cross sections are very, very nice. So parallel to. Well, I only drew one axis, so let's go perpendicular to the y-axis. How about that? So all of our cuts are going to be perpendicular to the y-axis. So we're going to make horizontal cuts the way I drew it. So if we cut like that, so we slice this way, what shape do we get? And these will all be perfect squares if we slice this way. So we're going to get the squares if we cut like this. And the squares are, I think, the best, certainly the easiest way to compute the area, because that's just side times side, or side squared. So we're going to slice that way, and our cross sections are squares now. So let's figure out some limits of integration. So this thing is three meters tall, or just three units tall. And 
let's start it at zero. I flipped it upside down. So at zero, we had a uh, side length of zero. If I wrote it the other way, at zero, we'd have a side length of three. So I just did this so our the function we come up with at zero will be zero itself. What is the maximum y value? If we start at zero, what's our max y value? So we're going to go zero to three. So that's our max y value. I can already start our integral. Is it dx or dy or d something else? <coughs> so this one will be a dy because we're going up the y axis. We're changing our y, vari our y uh, value with each slice. So there's going to be a dy. There's a few ways to think about it. One way is dy. Just think about dy measures the width of one cross section, basically. So that dy is a tiny little bit of, or change in y, but a tiny change in y. So it's the width of the cross section. Another way to think about it, it's the variable you have to change to cover your entire region. So if I change my x variable and move my slice sideways, I'm not actually covering any more of the region. I'd just be slicing the same slice over and over again. I need to change my y coordinate. So we also need an area function of y. Not an area function of x, but an area function of y, because we have a dy integral. So we're going to create a of y. If I knew the side length at y, all I'd have to do is square it because we have our shape as a square. So if I could figure out what is the length of a side, I just square it, and that's my area. So that'll be side length squared. So now it's figured out what is the side length. Maybe we could use a possibly. So let's think about let's do some easy computations. What is side length of zero? Zero, side length of three. So that'll be three. So we have zero length at the point right there at the bottom. And when we go to the largest, uh, all the way up to the largest slice at the top, our height is three and our side length is also three. When we said side length, we mean the. So I'll draw in green just one of the sides of the slice. And it's a square, so each, even though I drew it, it looks like the other two sides are tiny. It's just a perspective I drew it in. No, I don't think you want me to teach art class. <laughs> so this picture was constructed with lines. That's a strong indication it's probably going to be a linear function. And we just got two points. How many points do you need to make a line? Two. two. So we know s of 0 is 0, s of 3 is 3, and s is a linear function. So s of y equals, let's go with my plus b. So it looks like the mx plus b form. So s of 0 equals 0, that tells me about b right there. So that tells me b is 0. You can plug it in if you want to. s of 0 is m times 0 plus b. And s of 0 is 0, so that tells me b equals 0. So plug that back in, s of y equals my. Now I said to figure out slope, and we'll use a second point for that now. S of 3 is m times 3, and this equals 3. So m is 1. So our s of y function is 1y plus 0, or just 1y. So there is the side length. If you know about y, the side length is just y itself. You may have had that intuition already, but I just wanted to write it out just in case uh, 
if the height was like 13 instead of 3, I could have done exactly the same steps I did right here and would have gotten the uh, correct slope. Because they were both three, you could sort of figure it out in your head. But if only because I knew it was a linear function, because it uh, it expanded in a linear way, basically. Uh, if if we had some weird shaped pyramid, like it was curved out like that, I don't know if I could finish this drawing nicely. <laughs> oh, it's the worst space ever. But if it's some weird shaped pyramid, you couldn't. I couldn't say that. You know, slicing it up might be like a quadratic or something like that, or, or maybe a square root in this case. Um, so if, if your pyramid looked weird, it wasn't the sides weren't lines. I, I couldn't; it wouldn't be a linear function. So then, how would you figure out the side? So if we we're building a skateboard ramp that shapes something like this, and of course it has some depth to it, but I don't want to try to draw all that. Uh, and then I'm going to take cross sections. The cross sections will be rectangles, but they won't increase in a linear or decrease in a linear way in this case. Now I need to model this curve with a function right there. Even though, you know, at the beginning it would be this full width and at the top the width would be zero. Right, so how do you find the a of y? Uh, the, sh the answer to that is very carefully. Okay. Uh, just looking at this, um, I think that's in a skateboard world, that's a circle. So uh, x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals c squared, or you can use different letters, and then figure, you know, solve for x, solve for y, depending on which that you needed to. Um, if you need a function of x, you would solve for y. If you needed a function of y, you would solve for x, basically. The most difficult part of all this is finding your area function. That's the hard part. Usually your endpoints are not too bad. Drawing your region can be tricky too, but generally the hardest part is finding your function that represents the area of the cross section. And there are bad choices. There are bad ways to break it down. So you want to break it down in ways so your cross sections are nice shapes. Triangles, squares, rectangles, circles, things like that. All right, so let's go ahead and put all this together. So we got our a of y is s of y squared. So this is, s of y is just y squared. So that's your area function. So this integral is super easy to do. So go ahead and finish it off. You still have a tiny bit of fractions to deal with. So with that one-third base times height formula for the area of a pyramid, our pyramid was a square, and the base measurement was the same as the height. So base is a times a, area of the base a times a, and the height is uh, times another a. So we get one-third a cubed. And if you look at what we got somewhere here, one-third, we just happen to stop at 3. If I put a, little a, instead of 3, we would get a cubed right here. So our computation matches the actual volume formula. Can you scroll up just so I can make sure I that one little portion yeah. of the volume? Yeah, that's not really necessary though. Oh, I wrote area. That's not the area. That's the volume. But that was just a side note, not, not part of what our actual work. So I'm going to take that out of the notes. So some of these shapes, there'll be a formula you can look at and say, oh, this is the area of whatever shape you happen to be working on. Uh, a pyramid's not terribly obscure, but there'll be plenty of other way more obscure shapes that we'll be looking at. I think our next one's sort of like a slice of an orange. 
um, except not quite. So I will write out the problem and then we will start it tomorrow. Well, finish it tomorrow too, hopefully. So we have a curved wedge. Is cut from a cylinder. of radius 3 by two planes. One plane is perpendicular to the axis. And the second plane crosses the first plane at a 45 degree angle. At the center of the cylinder. Find the volume of the wedge. Everybody saw that disappear. I hope not, although, oh, that's fantastic. Well, at least it's being recorded. So one big Microsoft commercial. <laughs> This is what I want. So I guess give feedback to Microsoft. Oh yeah. All right, we don't need to record this though. <laughs> oh. Thank <laughs> you.